Welcome, Emmanuel. We're glad you're joining us for worship today. We hope you've been enjoying our live streams online. And we want you to know that we have daily devotionals up on our website, so we hope you guys have been staying engaged there. And turn your speakers up, and let's get ready for worship.
Lord's paved my way with grace. Love me through my darkest hours. A thousand different
Father God, as we end this quiet moment of praise in our homes, we, we just want to thank you for all that you're doing. But in the midst of all the chaos, God, we just want to, to glorify you, to magnify your name, because we know that in the midst of all of our troubles and our trials and our tribulations, God, there is no one but you. And so we pray that you, you make that apparent in our lives, that all of our problems just seem a little bit smaller when compared to your glory, God. Just be with us in this moment. Father, as we, as we go into this next week, not knowing what's gonna happen, God, just be with us. Allow us to take hold of every, every opportunity you give to us to not, only, to not only know you, but to show others who you are, because there's no one but you. In all these things we pray, amen. I hope our worship this morning has touched your heart as it has mine. It's important to remember that um, worshiping God is what we are made for in good times and even in difficult times. And we are certainly facing some difficult times in our nation right now. That's why I started a new series last week called Hope for Challenging Times. But before we get into it, I would like to express my appreciation and gratitude for all of the healthcare professionals that are part of Emmanuel Church. These people are serving on the front lines of a fight, and we want to lift them up in our prayers. And so I want to encourage you, if you know somebody in our church or even part of another congregation, and you would like to express your gratitude to them, send them a note, send them an email, send them a text, and just say, we love you and we're praying for you. Today's message is, let go of anxiety. God's got this. Has your anxiety level gone up over the last couple weeks? I think a lot of people's have. Maybe you know someone who tested positive and you're thinking to yourself, when was the last time I had contact with them? Maybe you've been reduced at work your hours or maybe you've been laid off. I read an article before I came over and said that one out of every four workers in America is now laid off or furloughed. Maybe you're in leadership at work and you're faced with making some really tough decisions. Um, how's it going working remotely? I've talked to several people who now have two or three people working in the home. Somebody's in the living room, somebody's in the dining room, somebody's in an upstairs bedroom, somebody's in the den area. Uh, how's it going? Uh, are your kids bored at home? I received a... Um, letter this week from one of the kids at Emmanuel, and it's uh, a colored picture, and it's Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, do not be anxious or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with us wherever you go. And on the back side, he wrote me a note. He said, dear Pastor Mark, I miss going to church. I really miss coming to church. Are you bored? Well, I think this young man is kind of bored himself, but thank you for the note. Um, while it's easy to be anxious, God's word is very clear in saying that we are not to be anxious really about anything. But that's easier said than done, isn't it? Um, how can we do that? How can we really confidently trust God in this difficult moment? If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Now, I'll be sharing from the New Living Translation and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice three things about this verse that will be helpful to you, especially when you're feeling anxious. The promise, the provision, and the prerequisite. Let's look first at the promise. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs. 
God promises to, to supply all of your needs, not just some of them, but all of them. Now, how could the Apostle Paul make such a confident statement? He made it for two reasons. First of all, he made it because he knew the character of God. From the very beginning, God has been taking care of people. For example, Adam and Eve, he put them in the Garden of Eden, and the Garden of Eden provided for all of their needs. Uh, Noah and the ark. When the flood came, Noah was protected with his family because he was in an ark. What about the children of Israel? When they needed a deliverer, God raised up Moses. When they needed water, God got water from a rock. When they needed food, God provided manna from heaven. God has always been in the business of providing for his children. Jesus said, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is core because it really shows us that God serves us. As crazy as that may sound, God loves to serve us and God loves to provide for our needs. Now, I don't know what your concept of heaven is, whether you think God is up there in heaven with his feet propped up, eating bonbons all day long, but the reality is, is that God is harnessing the resources of heaven to meet your needs. The Apostle Paul also understood the character of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? Think about this. Everything is a gift. Everything you have is a gift. The next breath that you take is a gift from God. That old car that you get into that you prefer to have a, a better car, that's still a gift from God. Everything is gift. Now, the other reason why the Apostle Paul could be so confident in saying that his God would supply all of our needs is because he knew it from firsthand experience. Paul was living proof that God could be trusted to take care of his needs. In the verses just previous to verse 19, our text, he says these words, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or on everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now here's what that means. The Apostle Paul knew what it was like to eat filet mignon every single night. But he also went through times in which he ate ramen noodles for months or years on end. And you know what he discovered? That whether his belly was full or empty, or whether he had lots of money in the bank, or whether he had very little in the bank and wasn't sure where his next meal was coming from, he had a confidence in him that knew that God was going to take care of him. What about you? Do you have that kind of confidence? That deep down inside, you know that God is going to take care of you. And it's because you can look at your past and say, yeah, God has provided for me. Hey, last year when I was going through a difficult time, God provided for me. Hey, two years ago when my kids were sick, God provided for me. Hey, three years ago when I was out of work, God provided for me. Do you have that kind of confidence based on your past experience? Stop and think about this. Has God ever really let you down? Now, there have been times in which you didn't get what you wanted, and sometimes we have to try to figure out the difference between needs and wants. But God has provided in his time. Sometimes God's timing isn't our timing. I once read a book entitled, God has never failed me, but he sure has scared me to death. Isn't that the truth? There have been times in my own life and in, in, in my uh, married life when Holly and I didn't have very little. And right down to the wire, God finally supplied that need. God has promised to take care of his children and he has promised to provide for all of our needs and we're living proof of that. And you can look back in your past and experience the same thing. In other words, breathe easy, friend. God's got this. Let's look at God's provision, all your needs. So I've been thinking about this week. So what are the needs that you and I have? I've come up with five. And the question is, how does God meet these five needs? All of these needs, everybody has. You have them, I have them, everybody you know has them. Uh, need number one, basic life needs. You know, food, 
clothing, shelter. Listen to Matthew 6, 31 and 32. So don't worry about these things, Jesus said, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What shall we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Some of you have been laid off this week. I said a couple months ago in a message that 75% of all Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And some of you are experiencing a little bit of margin right now, but in three or four or five weeks, you may not be experiencing that margin. Here's the good news. God has promised to take care of all your basic needs. You will be able to pay your bills. You will be able to put food on the table. Psalm 37, five says, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Think about that. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. God knows how to take care of all your basic needs. So the question is, how does God do that? Well, most of the time God does that through work. Work is a gift. Now for some of you, you love your job. For others of you, not so much. But we ought to be looking at the fact that if we have a job, that's one of the primary ways that God takes care of our needs by giving us work to do. It brings us satisfaction um, through government assistance. Uh, I think in a couple of weeks, most Americans are going to be receiving a check from the government. Hey, there's a lot wrong with our country, but I have to tell you, praise God that the government is sending funds and has available funds to meet your needs. What else? Through the generosity of others. People just helping other people. Let me share with you some ways that you can be generous with other people. You know that Emmanuel supports an inner city mission called Front Step. And I received a letter this week saying that they were desperately in need of food. And so in the next several days, we're going to organize a food drive at Emmanuel. You're going to get word from it. We'll put it out on the website. I'll send a congregational letter. You can drive by in your car and give some food and we'll take it from you. And then we're going to put it in a truck and bring it down. And that's going to happen next Sunday. Man on Main Street in Lansdale. Man on Main Street is committed to providing basic um, food items and um, food supplies for more vulnerable people in our community. And if you want to help out Man on Main Street, they would be thrilled to receive your assistance. What about the American Red Cross? We were contacted this week asking if we would do a blood drive because they are desperate for blood. So here's what we're going to do. As soon as we get all the details put together, we're going to have a blood drive at the church. And we're going to invite everybody to come and give blood so that we can support the American Red Cross. There's going to be many more opportunities in the weeks ahead in order for you and I to be generous, to bless other people. One last way that God takes care of our basic needs, and that is the church, his family. On our website is an opportunity to give to our benevolence fund. I really want to encourage you to do that because, you know, most people have a week or two of supplies um, and financial resources. But as we go longer into this coronavirus um, crisis, um, people are going to need some financial resources and we're committed to helping as best we can. Number two, emotional needs. Have you discovered that you're not always the best version of yourself? I'm not always the best version of myself either. Um, we know we shouldn't be discouraged, but we are. We know we shouldn't get angry sometimes, but we do. We know we shouldn't get stressed out and be fearful, but sometimes we do. We know we shouldn't feel weak and we should always be strong, but we're not. God promises to calm your emotions and to lift you up when you're feeling down. Now, how does he do that? He does that primarily through his word and he gives us many promises and many truths that he wants us to commit to memory so that when our emotions fluctuate, God is able to speak to our hearts and bring calm to the raging storm inside of us. So let me just give you a couple of scriptures that have been meaningful in my own personal journey. Joshua chapter one, verse nine, do not be afraid or discouraged for I am the Lord, your God, and I will be with you wherever you go. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Think about it. The God of the universe cares for you. And I love Matthew 6, 34. Jesus says it. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't borrow from tomorrow problems. Leave them there. Learn to live in the present moment of God's provision and his grace in your life. We also have a need for friends. Um, I'm calling this social needs. Psalm 68, five says, God puts the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and he gives them joy. You know, everybody has a need to be loved, to be accepted and to belong. Loneliness is the real pandemic in America. And it's a prison that God never intended for you to be in. He wants you to break free out of that prison and he wants to fill you with the joy of belonging. Now, you may have, had, you may have a great family and you may have lots of friends and you ought to praise God for that. But there's lots of people who come from fragmented and broken families and they don't really have a great family system or they don't really have a friend network. Some of you don't have a mom or a dad or siblings that support you. You know, years ago in another church, I was driving the church van picking up kids for vacation Bible school. And there was this one nine, 10 year old girl that was always late. I'd have this, you know, van full of kids and I'd swing by her house and I'd be beeping the horn and kind of waiting and checking my watch. And she was always having a difficult time getting out. And so we could go to vacation Bible school. And one day I just kind of probed a little bit and I said, Hey, tell me about your mom and dad. And then her face, she just went like this and said, well, I don't know where my dad is. And my mom, she's sick and I have to make a meal for my brothers and sisters and my mom. And then I just felt super guilty, right? I'm thinking, where is this girl? She can't get out of the house in time. Well, she's making a meal. She couldn't have been more than 11, 12 years old and she's taking care of her mom. And then later on, a couple months later, I discovered that that mom was actually on drugs and the little girl just didn't want to tell me. She just said, mommy was sick. Hey, there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of fragmentation in families, but God has promised to put the lonely in families. Maybe you've been deeply hurt by people and you just have a hard time making friends. I get that. God will help you to build trust, to open up your spirit in order to develop friendships again. You know, there's a lot of people that eat dinner alone. Uh, somebody sent me a text this week and it had a picture, I think it was from Babylon B, but it had a picture of a Zoom meeting where all these other people had potluck dinners. And I got to thinking that that was a spoof, but I got to thinking that, well, what would be wrong with going on Zoom? If you don't know what Zoom is, just look it up, zoom.com. And it's free, first 40 minutes are free. And if you sign up, here's what you can do. You can actually connect with another person and you can have dinner together remotely. That could be a lot of fun. God has promised that he would always provide a family for his children. You know what that family is? It's the church. With all of the church's imperfections, I need to tell you, the church is the best thing going. And we have a great church at Emmanuel. God wants the church to be the social and spiritual center of your life. Now, I want to say a word to some of you that are not a part of the Emmanuel Church family and you're listening. Uh, welcome. After this whole pandemic issue is over and things calm down and get back to normal, I want to encourage you to find a church where you can connect, that you feel comfortable in, a church that teaches from the Bible, a church that talks about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and you start going to that church and you open up your heart and receive friendship and receive God's blessings. Now, if you're in the area and you don't have a church family, let me invite you to Emmanuel because this is a great place where you can belong and be accepted. There's another need. It's um, the need to feel safe. Second Samuel 22, two and three says, my God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is the power that saves me and my place of safety. You know who wrote those words? David, before he was king of Israel. 
Now there was another king, King Saul, and he was a bad king. And King Saul was trying to kill David, as well as many other people trying to kill David. But David wrote a hymn. He wrote a song, and that's what 2 Samuel 22 is. And David was saying, you know what? In the midst of an unsafe place, I've made God my safe place. Now here's the point. Others may hurt you, but God is your safe person. Other people may reject you, but God will never reject you. God will never hurt you because he is for you. He's not against you. When you need protection, run to the Lord. He will show you what to do. The last need that we all have is, is spiritual need. Spiritual needs are our desire to connect with God, our desire to know that we have a plan and a purpose in our lives. God made you on purpose. Even if your mom and dad didn't plan you, even if your mom and dad didn't want you, God wanted you. And he has a plan and purpose for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. We all have a God-shaped vacuum on the inside of us that only he can fill. And God wants you to reach out to him. Actually, he's been reaching out to you first, but God wants you to reach out to him and fill that great void that's in your heart. Okay, number three is a prerequisite. We've looked at God's promise. We've looked at his provision. Now I want to look at the prerequisite. From his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. God promises to meet all your needs, but there's a prerequisite. I heard a story many years ago about a guy who had all of his money tucked underneath of his mattress. And one day he was robbed and he went down to the local bank and said to the banker, um, I was robbed last night and I hold you responsible. And so I want my money back. And the banker looked at him and said, what are you talking about? And the man said, no, I had all of my money underneath my mattress and it was stolen and you have lots of money and I, I want you to give me my money back. And the banker said, we're not responsible for what hasn't been entrusted to us. Hey friend, God's not responsible for what hasn't been entrusted to him. Now, there's two ways that this works out. First of all, have you entrusted yourself to God? In other words, do you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? That's why you were made. You were made to have a relationship with God. And the way that we experience that is by having a heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. Last week, I talked in the message about how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not complicated. It's simply opening up your life, inviting Jesus Christ to come in, asking for forgiveness of all your sins, receiving forgiveness and receiving cleansing. Have you done that? But there's something else. God wants you to entrust him with all of your fears and all of your anxieties too. All of these basic needs that I've talked about, you know, the needs for safety and the needs for friendship, the need for basic things. God wants you to trust that. God doesn't want you to have anxiety over those things. So I'm gonna pray in just a moment. And while I pray, I'm gonna ask you, what do you need to give to God? What's your biggest fear right now? What's your biggest anxiety? That is your greatest need. So as I pray, I'm going to ask you to just pray along with me and give God whatever is on your heart and entrust him with it. And I promise you, he will meet your need. Lord Jesus, thank you for your promise that you would meet all of our needs according to your glorious riches. Lord, you have a stockpile of riches that are inexhaustible. All of the resources of heaven are focused on helping us. So Lord, there's some people that have some real spiritual needs and I pray God that you would meet them. There's some people that have some needs of they're out of work and they, they need to have some financial resources and they need to do some things in the next few weeks to help them get by. 
God, help them to give those needs over to you. There's some people that are just so lonely. God, place them in families. Father, there are some people that are in an unsafe place, emotionally or physically. Father, be their place of safety. Now, I'm going to give you just a moment and I'm going to ask you to just talk to the Lord, just like you'd be talking to a friend. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here's what's really causing me anxiety. And just tell the Lord about it and say, would you help me? I now give it over to you. I'm going to pause for just a moment as you do that. Lord, would you receive what has been handed to you and entrusted to you? And we confidently declare that you're going to meet every single need. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I created some discussion questions for those that are at home and family or those of you who are connecting through a conference call or Zoom or go to meeting in your small group. And so let me give you these discuss discussion questions. They're also posted on our website um, in the daily devotional section as well. So you can refer to those questions. Let me give them to you. Share some need that God has met in your past that gives you confidence now to trust him. So can you remember a time when God meant a need? Maybe it was last week, last month, last year. Well, share that with your family or share that in your small group. Because it's going to give you confidence to trust God in this present moment. And it may provide confidence for somebody else to say, yeah, if God does it for him or her, God will do it for me. Question number two. Which one of the five needs, what are they? Basic needs, emotional, social, safety, and spiritual. Which one of these five needs is causing you the most anxiety right now and why? Uh, this is an opportunity for you to open up and just say, hey, I'm really struggling with. Three, what scriptures could you memorize or you could do a Google search that address each of these needs. What I have found helpful is if I can put a scripture passage to every one of these needs and memorize it, whenever I feel anxiety, the Holy Spirit helps me recall that scripture. And then God uses it to give me comfort. And then the last question is, what's the best prayer that somebody could pray for you right now? What would you like somebody to pray for for you right now? And then just ask, would you just pray over me? You, you can say it out loud or you can say it silently. It doesn't matter because God knows your heart. But just pray for everybody in your family or everybody in your small group. Just go around the room and say, hey, how can I pray for you? Hey, it's great to be with you. And remember, stick around for communion. I want to invite you to get your communion elements out. Pastor Jungmo is going to lead us in a very sacred, special time of celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Thank you. At this moment, we are preparing to receive the communion together. Communion is an ordinance given to all the believers by Jesus to remember his sacrifice for us and to symbolize the new covenant. The elements of the bread and wine, juice, and waters are symbols of Jesus Christ's broken body and shed blood. Communion is not a means of salvation, rather it is a testament of our faith in, a, in the stoning work of the cross. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, why don't we take a moment to prepare the element so that we can partake the communion together? Luke chapter 24, 
two Jesus disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus. It was the very first Easter Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead. They are leaving Jerusalem in fear for their life. They thought Jesus was the Messiah. Now Jesus was crucified, so they also thought they could be killed. Yes, they are fleeing to Emmaus. They are intensely talking about all the miracle of Jesus, his teaching, his crucifixion, and the rumor that his body disappeared, which they heard that morning. They were so confused. They were in grief, and they were fearful. All of a sudden, a man appears to them and starts talking with them. The man quotes the scripture from the Old Testament teaching what all the passages point toward Jesus Christ. But Gospel Luke say that God kept them from recognizing that he is Jesus Christ. Their eyes were blinded. Although they did not recognize him as Jesus Christ, they were so amazed by his teaching and begged him to stay the night with them. So Jesus go their home. At that night, Jesus took the bread and blessed it as he did in the Last Supper. Then he broke it and he gave it to them. Then through the communion, suddenly their eyes are open and they are able to recognize him, Jesus Christ. It seems like every morning we wake up to a new peril such as a pandemic. We may feel helpless as all negative news spin out our control. As those, who, as those two disciples experience, you may say, I was so confident to follow Jesus and believe in him devoutly, but now I'm so confused or even fearful. But today at this communion, I pray yours and my eyes may be open and recognized the truth that Jesus has been always walking with us. Yes, you have never been alone. Right now, by remembering our Savior Jesus Christ, our God open our eyes and let us witness that he is already with us. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, Preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Blood of our Lord, Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and thanks for. Let's pray. Open the eyes of my heart, O God. Open the eyes of my heart, O God. I want to see you. I want to see you. Jesus, what a privilege it is to worship you and to be under your wings now in your presence, we are reminded that your body was shaped, broken for us and that your body, your blood was shed in our behalf. We acknowledge that we bore our sin, fear, disease, sorrow, grief, and sickness. Through your sacrifice, we have complete redemption. Yes, we are forgiven. We are redeemed, so we give thanks for it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.